Our first reading comes from Song of Songs, chapter 2, on page 679. I shall be reading from verse 8 until the end of verse 13. Song of Songs, chapter 2, verses 8 to 13. Listen, my lover, look, here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. My lover is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows peering through the lattice. My lover spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come with me. See, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit, and the blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. Here ends the lesson. second reading is from James, the book of James, on page 1213. 1213. Uh, chapter 1, starting at verse 17, is all about perseverance and faith in the word. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the world of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of all he created. My dear people, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen slow to anger and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, and doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the word. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel reading today comes from Mark chapter 7. It can be found on page 1010 in the Church Bibles. Starting with verses 1 to 8 and then 14 and 15 
and 21 to 23. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law had come from Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus, and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. Verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. Verse 21. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these are evils come from inside and make a man unclean. This is the word of the Lord. I'm going to invite Lee to come forward and share with us. Just pray for you. Father God, we thank you for Lee and we thank you for the message that you've laid on his heart. Lord, I pray that you give him your words and that he will sow seeds of great value in the hearts of those of us willing to hear you this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jacqueline. Good morning, everyone. Everybody wide awake now? You didn't stand much chance, really, did you, after that earlier song we did? I had this real fear. I, wearing this headset thing, I don't like it. I prefer a, a handheld one, but it, it makes more sense to wear this. But when you wear this, um, and you have it on from the beginning of the service. You have real faith in the person in the PA booth. Because Mel said every one of us has a song in us, and I thoroughly believe that. But I also know that not every one of us has a voice in us. And I also believe that as well, because my own voice is not good. And I'm really, really concerned that at one point, Mark or whoever's in the PA booth is going to have a real sense of humor and think, I'm just going to slide that, that back up again and uh, shock everyone in church. But this morning, we're going to look at our actions. We're going to look at actions and what they do and to do that we're going to look at the passage in James so I would encourage you to, to have that passage open it's uh, James chapter 1 uh, starting at, at verse 17 and as I was praying I was really really pleased because the Lord definitely laid the James passage on my heart which is really good because I'm a bloke and doing more than one passage at a time is like multitasking um, I thought oh, that's going to be like really really hard work if I have to do that but it was clearly James that, that God uh, laid on my heart. But to introduce it, uh, I thought we'd start off with a little bit of humor. And uh, I don't know how many of you are involved with either young people or young at heart people. And every now and again, you'll see them with headphones in and they'll have the phone or the iPad or the laptop in front of them. And all of a sudden, there'll just be this outrageous laughter uh, because they're watching something that's really, really funny. Well, this happened a little while ago. Um, it wasn't actually at, at home. It was somewhere else. Someone was watching it. And I saw the video they were watching, and I thought, that is such a good video. A lot of the videos we can watch, they're just staged, aren't they? We look at them thinking, there's no way that's real. You've just done that to put it on YouTube and get yourself a few likes or a few watches. But this one's genuine because it's CCTV. And it's so stupid, it has to be actually real. So I'm going to show you this just to show how our actions can have consequences. The 
very short, very, very to the point, but I thought it illustrated perfectly how our actions can have consequences. And if only that guy had had a look behind him and saw what had happened to his friend, I'm sure he wouldn't have picked up the other stone uh, and thrown the other one, but he did. We had this passage read to us, didn't we? And this is really, really, it's a passage and a half. And there's an awful lot in it. And we're probably just going to skim the surface of it this morning. But if we take up the challenge of actually applying what it says, we will leave here different. But we don't just want to leave here different for today, do we? We want to be different tomorrow and the next day. Because so often with, um, with talks in church, with our quiet times, with our reading of scripture, we read it and we think, that's really good. You know, I read that, oh, I should change, I should, I should do that. And then we walk away and we don't do it. But before we get into the passage, I just want to do a little bit of a, a, little bit of a backdrop to what's going on in this book. James is the author. Okay, he's writing this. It's a letter. Um, and he's writing it to some, to some believers who have been scattered due to persecution. But James, the most l- brilliant thing I like about James is James is the brother of Jesus. Now, can you just imagine being at a party or one of those church gatherings where you have to turn around to the person next to you and say a little bit about yourself, or maybe you're in a kind of a meeting and it says, well, we're going to go around the room and we're going to say one thing about ourselves, and everyone sits there thinking, oh, what am I going to say about myself? But can you imagine James just going, yeah, yeah Jesus, my brother. And it's like, and he wasn't just saying it as, a, you know, you know I'm, a, I'm a disciple. Jesus was actually his brother. How cool would that be? Actually, you know, Jesus is your brother. We've all got a relationship with Jesus, but can you imagine living in Bible times and actually seeing Jesus as, as, as your brother? He was actually your brother and all that he did. And you're like, wow, how amazing would that be? But he's writing this letter to equip, challenge, bless, and spur on some Christians who have actually been scattered because of this persecution. Now, we think sometimes, don't we, that Christian life can be, can be a little bit hard. You know, It might be tough in the workplace because, you know, I get the mickey taken out of me a little bit because I'm a Christian. That doesn't happen to me, but then I'm working the church, so you'd hope it wouldn't do. But I know when I worked in an office, and I know when I was a truck driver, that very often it was the butt of the jokes. You know, you'd be like you know, the, you know, the Holy Squad or the God Squad or the Bible Basher, all these different things. And we get a little bit uptight and a little bit upset. But I don't think any of us in this room have really, really experienced persecution. Not like many of our brothers and sisters around the world do. Uh, my father-in-law works with Open Doors. Um, well, he volunteers with Open Doors. And he goes all over the world. He's just come back from India. And some of the stories he tells, you know, we read them, but some of the things he tells me about what is happening to our brothers and sisters around the world who are persecuted is unbelievable. But that's a completely different sermon. And I think, actually, as, as Christians, we need to be aware of what's happening around the world to our brothers and sisters. And we need to be praying for them. We need to be supporting them where we can and when we're able. But these Christians have all been scattered and they're having a really, really tough time. They were being um, abused physically. They were being abused financially. And the financial abuse came because actually very often uh, Christians at the time, they were avoided. So if you were a a Christian, uh, if you had a trade, if you had a business, very often because of the persecution, you couldn't work. Your livelihood would be affected and you'd be pulled back from being able to do that. So not only were you scattered to another part, maybe an area you didn't know so well, you weren't able to work, and you were really, really mistreated. And this is the the backdrop to what James is writing. And James is writing to them and telling them how to live in the world and yet not be completely of the world. He's writing to them to how to keep harmony with their brothers and sisters, their Christian brothers and sisters, how they can support each other, how can they can love each other, and how they can do all of this even amongst all the problems that they're facing. And there's something in there for us as a church, isn't it, that we should actually, you know, we can have all sorts of things going on in our lives, but as a church family, we should be together. We should be supporting one another. We should be loving one another. Well, we're going to wake our way through the passage, and it's an absolutely fantastic uh, opening, the first verse. It says... It says in verse 17, Every good and perfect gift is from God above. Now, have you ever thought about that? Everything good comes from God. 
How many of you, if you're completely honest, how many of you, just put your hands up, let's, let's make this interactive. It's going to get more interactive as we go on, so I'd suggest you stay awake um, because there's things going to be happening later on that, let's just say you won't miss them if you're asleep because I'll make sure of it. Okay? But how many of you have got good things in your life? Put your hands up if you've got at least one good thing in your life. Yeah, I think that's pretty much everybody. We may have difficult things in our lives, but actually I think all of us can at least come up with some things that are good. And those good things come from God. God doesn't give us anything bad. You know, very often we think, you know, oh, you know, why is that happening to me? If it's bad, it hasn't come from God. God may sometimes allow bad things, but no bad thing will actually come from God. God always gives good things. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about my own life. And I was thinking, well, actually, yeah, if I stop and think, you know, um, my wife. My wife is a good thing uh, from God. Um, I'm not sure Trisha always feels the, the same way. Um, but she's a blessing. My family's a blessing. My job's a blessing. My house. The fact that I'm breathing is a blessing. The fact that, you know, I, I live in a town that's so multicultural. That's a good thing. That's a blessing. There's so many things we can be thankful for. But actually, we just need to actually recognize them. And often we don't. He goes to say that God created all the lights in the heaven. I'm going to put a picture up. Okay? Now, there's loads. If you put in the lights in the sky or the lights in heaven into Google, you get millions and millions. But this one particularly just caught my eye. God is the Father of all lights, He's the creator of all lights, He's the creator of the universe. And I think so often as, as Christians, we get so kind of like blasé about how amazing God is. We forget God is the creator of the universe. He's the creator of heaven and earth, and he's the creator of us, and yet we take it for granted. And it was interesting, just, um, just before I came up here, um, my son very quickly showed me a, a photograph, I showed it earlier, of the sunset yesterday. Didn't any of you see the sunset last night? Yeah, I, I completely missed it. I was inside, but he took a picture of it and just how amazing it was. And these early Christians, this would have been a reality to them because they didn't have all the distractions that we have. They had their own set of distractions, but they would have noticed the sky. They would have noticed the sunset. They would have noticed the stars and everything else. But how often in life do we go around like this? And we miss all of these amazing things that God puts in front of us every day. Now, I'm not going to go on that because real, it's a real soapbox of mine because... I see it so often now with parents. You know, they've got their little baby in the pushchair, and they've got one hand on the pushchair, and they've got one hand they're like they're doing this, and they're missing all those things. But how often, with just being Christian, God puts all these amazing things in the sky, in creation, in the fields. You know, we live in a big, built-up area like Luton, but you turn in any direction, and we've got green spaces. But how often do we not notice these things? It then goes on to say that God never changes. How many of you have had change in your life in the last little while? I bet quite a few of you have had some kind of change. But it says that Jesus, okay, God, it says he does not change like shifting shadows. Has anybody ever uh, stood in front of their shadow? How many of you remember as kids you try and catch your shadow? Yeah? I completely got confused over that as a child watching Peter Pan. Because can you remember that the original uh, Walt Disney, the, the, the Peter Pan, when he, he loses his shadow and, uh, and Wendy has to stitch it back onto him? You've seen that, the bit where she, she sews it back on? That completely confused me as a child. I was like, how, did, how does that even happen? Your shadow? It, it, I was a simple child. Still am simple. <laughs> but shadows change. Different times of the day, a shadow will look different. But Jesus doesn't change. It says in Hebrews... Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the one thing in our life that doesn't change. He's always going to be there. He's always going to be 100% reliable. He's always going to be there when we need him. We change in life, don't we? Yeah. How many of you, since you were in your early teens, have changed quite a bit? Yeah. I have. I had hair and I weighed 11 stone up until I got to 30. And then my mum always used to say to me, if you keep eating like that, it'll catch up with you later on in life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does, helps. I used, to, I used to literally work next door to a McDonald's, which is not good. Not good. But we change, don't we? 
Our size changes, our jobs change, our families change, our situation changes. Everything in our lives changes. And yet as people who love and follow Jesus, we've got something in our life that doesn't change. And in a world that's so fast-paced and so chaotic, it's great that we've got this foundation in Jesus who doesn't change. He's always there for us. And this next little bit should cause us to, cause us to, to worship. It says, as, as we follow through, and I'd encourage you, as I say, to have it in front of you. Um, it says, my dear brothers, take note. Um, he cho- sorry, uh, verse 18. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first, fruit, first fruits of all he created. Now, when we worship, we need to actually remember that God chose to give birth to us. And this is talking about spiritual birth. You know, it wasn't accidental that, that God chose us. It wasn't just a kind of, you know, all of a sudden one day God didn't have anything to do, so he just thought, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm going to choose this group of people to be me. He chose us. When you, when you look in the mirror in the morning, um, and you probably think, oh, crumbs, you know, the bags, the lines, the, I'm sure there was a little bit more hair at the side there, and that's, even that's going, yeah? We can think, actually, God, God chose me. God chose us. God loves me chose me and the thing is he continues to choose to have a relationship with us and God willingly did that he, we became like his prized possession and we were we prayed at the beginning of the service um, as we always do at the Christ Church and we were thinking that um, it's just how amazing it is that and it was a Dean Dean shared with us that God creator of the universe God who's absolutely awesome and amazing he actually chooses to listen to us when we talk. Now, I can remember hearing a, a little story about a little three-year-old girl who, uh, she came, uh, dad came home and he was reading the, the newspaper. This was the days before tablets when, you know, people actually held the, the newspapers. I know some people still do. And he was reading the paper. And the little girl kept going up to him, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. Yes, dear, yes, dear. And he still had the paper. She said, listen, I want you to look at me. I want you to li- listen to me. He says, but I want you to listen with your eyes. I want you to listen to me with your eyes. And God does that. God stops. Yeah? I'm, I'm just a human being. You're just a human being. In the grand scheme of things, we are really quite insignificant when we look at the whole of creation. And yet when you pray, when you talk to God, just like a father does or a mother does or an adult does to a child, he stops and he listens to you because he loves you. Now this letter, as I said, is quite action-packed and it gets now straight on to the doing. And I warn you, as, as I, as I realise myself, it may make you feel quite uncomfortable. And it goes on to say, my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you. Which God, which can which can save you. Now there's a good one. Slow to speak and quick to listen. Anybody ever get that one right all the time? How many people are quick to speak and slow to listen? I know I am. I do that probably hourly, if I'm honest. We often are quick to speak instead of slow to speak. Quick to get angry. Does that affect anybody here? Is anybody here quick to get angry? Come on, let's be honest. Come on, let's not just sit there and think it's everybody else. Who here is quick to get angry? Probably most of us. Okay? Yeah. We all know a few people who, you know, just don't, they, they just seem to have mastered that. And it is possible. It is possible. We hear of a situation and we're so quick to form an opinion on it we start to talk about it, we start to be affected by it. It might be in the news, it might be anything. We've always got a very quick judgment rather than actually being slow to speak but quick to listen. Let's get our facts right. Let's assess what's going on here. And as we do that, we very often find that God will speak to us more and more through it. God may even want us to be part of a solution. He might even want to lay on our hearts for us to do something in that. And if we're quick to speak, what does that very often quickly become? comes gossip you know I hear something has happened to, to somebody you know 
And I'm, you know, you can be so quick to speak and don't get your facts straight. Before you know it, you've passed that on to somebody else, and then they've passed it on. And before you know it, it's like Chinese whispers. And yet, if we're slow to speak and quicker to listen, we can get it a little bit more right. Or maybe the listening just comes the fact that God's placed you in a workplace. God's placed you in a in an educational environment. He's placed you um, in a in a being a being a mother at home and maybe there's conversations you have with neighbours or with, 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 uh, at the school gates and people want somebody to, just to listen to them do you know loads and loads of people have actually come to know Jesus because the person who brought them to faith just actually spent some time listening to them because we live in a world that's so busy and so manic nobody's got time for anybody else and yet maybe if we were just quick to listen and when somebody was speaking we were actually listening to what they were saying because how many of us if we're honest when somebody comes to us with a problem and we all love it don't we if someone comes to you for a little bit of advice we we get that kind of oh great you know comes to me for a bit of advice and before they've really finished speaking before we've really listened to what it is they're saying we're already formulating the solution in our mind now, this is a particular problem for blokes i found this out because if my wife your wife any other man woman relationship a woman will come and she's got a problem and the man will be very quick right yep yep this is how we fix it very often women what is it you just want you just want someone to listen okay i'm not saying that someone that does it i'm definitely a how do we fix it kind of person but actually we need to listen and if we listen to people maybe actually they'll actually want to know well, why, why is it you took the time to listen to me why, why are you like that and before you know it, there's an opportunity there to show our faith. With our children and young people today, they have less and less people willing to listen to them. They have less and less adults in their lives who have the time to listen to them. I work in several schools in and around the town. And so often, a young person's behavior will change drastically. And you'll be told, you know, what, what, what did you do? How did you do it? I just listened. And we're very quick to judge people's behaviour, aren't we? Have you ever been in the supermarket and you see a child that's being an absolute dreadful child? They're screaming, stomping, they're having a tantrum with their mum, and you just think, oh, that poor parent. Okay? I think now that, that parent, I, I will pray for the parent, but, but years ago I'd have thought, oh, God, how could anybody let their child get to behave like that? And then you look at your own children and you think you've got it all right, which actually you don't always get it right. But we don't stop to think, well, actually, maybe that child's got a problem. I work with a lovely young lad at the moment who's got, um, who's got autism. And as a really, really young child, his behavior, if you'd looked at him, was really, really bad. But actually, he's not a badly behaved child. There was a reason for that. He had autism. It's so often, as, even as Christians, we're quick to judge before we know all of the facts. And what about anger? This is the one where people lose eye contact with me now because you know, the head goes down because we realize, as I quickly realized, that this is one that affects us. We live in a time where I really do believe people now are more angry than I can remember, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. People get so angry and tense. One of the reasons I was really, really glad to give up HGV driving was there are just so many angry people on the road. And I realized that when I gave up HGV driving, that was one less angry person on the road because Pete gets so wound up over such simple little things and I'm guilty of it you know somebody cuts you up and delays you by a millisecond what do we do do we pray for that person Lord they're obviously in a hurry get them to where they need to go safely or do we just get really really like wound up and stressed by them have you ever watched people in a car you can take the nicest you could take an Andrew Bowers character yeah Andrew Bowers is one of our worship leaders the kind of guy that you know you could you could come in and tell him that you know the house is burning down and, and someone's stolen your car and everything's gone pear shaped and Andrew would go, oh, nothing seems to rile him, and yet the majority of people you put them in a car, what happens? I, I'm having this with it with one of, one of my teenage boys. One of my teenage boys now now drives. He's actually a very very good driver, but the other one isn't even driving yet. And when I'm driving. He gets angry at other drivers on my behalf. And he started to ride bikes now. He rides, he's got a road bike. 
And he gets annoyed at how close the other car drivers go. And all this. And I'm saying, Keenan, you need to calm this down. Because Sorry, I didn't mean to say your name. Okay? Because by the time you actually come to drive, you're going to be so kind of... But we do. We get so angry. But notice that the passage doesn't say, don't be angry. It says, be slow to anger. When I first read that, I thought, well, what's the difference? If you're going to get angry, why does it take time how quickly you get there? Okay? But then I thought, well, actually, most times, if you don't get angry quickly and you respond a bit slower, by the time you think about what's actually happened, you don't get angry about it. When someone cuts me up in traffic, if I react like that, it's very easy to get angry. But if I just pause for a bit, I'm not going to get angry because it'll all be over and thinking, well doesn't mean I have to drive like that or there may be a reason for them being quick and I learned a really good lesson um, on this from my wife the other day um, and she because we've, we've had quite a bit recently some of you are aware with my nephew having cancer and, and you never know what's happened um, in somebody's day and it really made me think you know sometimes you know someone you get angry at someone and you don't know why they're being like they're being there may have been something that happened earlier in their day it might be why they're responding like that. So let's always be slow to, slow to speak, quick to listen, but also slow to become angry. Let's delay the getting angry. And there are times, actually, it's okay to be angry. I get angry at the state that some young people are left in because of what happens to them in their families. I get angry um, at cancer. I get angry that there are, uh, are people starving in this world and there are others that have far too much. There are a lot of things that if we're really honest and we allow God through them, that we can use that anger for good. Anger to bring about change. But we have to be slow to anger for that to happen. And so often with our anger, it's not a healthy anger. Okay? And the Bible talks about you know, no longer doing this. And in the passage, uh, it says, get rid of. It literally says, get rid of all this moral filth. Get rid of this anger. Get, get rid of it. It's like having to clear out. It's not saying, well... Maybe I'll just keep a bit of it and might come. He's saying, get rid of it. And when I looked into to the meaning in the original text, it literally means to put off. And in Bible times, when people got baptized, they would take off their outer garment. They would then be baptized, and they would come out, and there would be some, like we have somebody now there, don't we? have the kind of obligatory person that holds the towel for you. And it's a real honor to be asked to hold the towel for someone in baptism. But they would then have another outer garment that they would put back on again. And part of the reason they kept with that tradition is it was a physically putting off. It was showing not only were they being baptized and getting rid of their old life, they were showing by their clothes they were putting off their old life as they went into, into baptism. And here's a, is a really good quote for you that I came across um, on anger. A lady once walked up to a well-known preacher called Billy Sunday, and he was around in the early part of the 1900s, after one of his famous meetings, and said to him, is anything wrong when I lose my temper? I blow up quickly, but then it's all over. And Billy Sunday replied, lady, so does the shotgun, and look at the damage it inflicts. And that really, really made me think. You know, we, we do get angry, but look at, the, look at the difference. A gun goes off how quick? Really, really quick. But look at the damage it does. And so often with our anger, and I feel a real hypocrite, but I'm not, I'm not preaching at you as we're sharing this together because I get angry. I get wound up. I do the shotgun effect. But we have to look at the damage that it can do. Next it goes on to say that we are to accept the word that God has put in our hearts. Okay, it says that God has put this word in our hearts. And I think sometimes, you know, you think, well, why not in our heads? You know, something goes in your head, that's where your brain is, why you can process it better. Okay, but to put in our hearts, because I think that's where it's going to do the most good. Because very often information can go in the head, but it never filters its way down into the heart. But if it starts in here, I think it stands more chance of filtering its way back up into there. But to fully understand that, we need to go back to the Old Testament. Uh, and if you want to look it up, feel free, if not, make a note. It's Jeremiah uh, chapter 31. And verse 31 to 34, it's going to be up on the screen as well. 
And it says this, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It, it, will, not be like, it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Now, if God has planted this word in our hearts, when you plant something, do you then just leave it? If you just plant something and you don't do anything with it, what will eventually happen to it? It's going to die. It's going to stay stagnant. Now, whenever I think about anything like this, I always think of my good friend Bob at the back there because he is Mr. Greenfingers. And we've had many a conversation on, on a Wednesday at Wednesday Church, and I'll be saying about, oh, this blessed weather in this country is raining again. And Bob's like, yeah, 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 we need the rain. It's all those, you know, all those farmers. And he always brings out the positive. And it's like, well, actually, yeah. But it's like that with God's word. God's planted it in our hearts. But if we don't act upon it, if we don't study scripture, if we don't spend time in prayer with God, if we don't spend time fellowshipping with other believers, if we don't spend time worshipping, then that word's not going to go anywhere in our heart. It's not going to grow. It's not going to develop. It's not going to lead us to action. We need to apply God's word that he's planted in our heart. Now, one of the things that, that James does extremely well, many of the things James does extremely well, he uses metaphors really, really well. And I love the one with the mirror. Okay? It talks about uh, a man uh, who looks into a mirror. And we'll, we'll just read it uh, again uh, together. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So I thought for this morning, we're going we're gonna to illustrate that. I crept into my, my daughter's bedroom while she was still asleep this morning and I removed her mirror, which I must say has now left at least one tidy area in her bedroom. Okay, now if I was to hold this mirror up, what can you all see? Boy, what do you see? Oh dear, yeah? You're seeing calendar opportunities, aren't you? Okay? Do you all see yourself? Okay? If I quickly turn the mirror around, how many of you remember what you look like? Has anybody already forgotten what they look like? Does anybody wish they could forget what they look like? Okay? We, very, we don't forget, do we? You, know, you might have to go back, and I think some people probably spend a lot more time uh, than others in front of mirrors. Um, does seem to be a thing in my house. But we don't forget what we look like, do we? You know, we might look at a photo from 10, 15 years ago and think, crumbs, is that me? Okay, but when we look at a mirror, we don't forget what we look like. And it's the same with God's word. When we, when we read it, when we look at it, it needs to be like that mirror. We need to remember what it says. We may need to go back to the mirror. We may need to go back to God's word. But we don't forget. We need to continue. And we do that through, like I said, prayer, worship, time together. And God will bless us as we live it out. In verse 25, it says, But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Now, one of the little things, just a little side note here, it's interesting to say that, you know, it's sort of like listening to the word. We forget that in Bible times, a lot of people couldn't, when certainly the people, people uh, that James was writing this letter to, they wouldn't have been able to read. So they relied on actually listening to the word. And I think actually we miss an opportunity there because it's great to read scripture, but actually sometimes it's good to listen to it as well. Maybe in your, you know, with, with a friend or in your small group or with family, just get somebody to read it while you're listening to it. Many of the Bible apps now you can get um, on some of your, your devices. You can actually press the button at the bottom and it will read it to you. And what a great way to maybe to spend some time with God is just to allow the, the word to be read to you. Now, there's all these things that, you know, we need to be getting into the word, we need to be doing the word, all this action talk that, that James talks about. But I heard a quote this week, um, and many of you are probably familiar with Francis Chan. He's one of my, uh, um, my favorite speakers, preachers, Bible teachers, because he always takes you back to God's word. He never, ever... Um, says 
this is what I say and it's right. He says, this is what I say, go back to the word and check what I'm saying. And he says, actually, we're in fear in this day and age of becoming sermon-proof. So we become sermon-proof. And as I was watching, he was talking about how we, we hear God's word and, and we know what to do with God's word, but actually, it just runs off us. We don't actually do anything with it. So here comes a, 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 another metaphor. Okay, this is one of my own ones. So for this, I'm going I'm to ask for a volunteer. Uh, who am I going to pick? Dean's not avoiding. Like, Dean, can you come up here a minute, please? Okay, Dean. Yeah, can you can you just put this on? Just put that on a minute. Zip it up. It's mine. Yeah, it's new. I got it at New Wine this year. It's my new waterproof coat. It's the first one I've got that actually doesn't make me look ten years older. It's a bit big for you. Yeah, it's a large. Okay. Do it, make sure you do it up. Now, what what I need now is I need somebody that somebody that knows you. Um, actually, Jody, can you come up and help me just for one minute? You'll like this. You're, you're going to enjoy this. Okay. Okay. Now. You need to pump it. It's one of those little pumpy ones. Okay. Give, give it a give it a pump. Really build the pressure. Come, on. don't don't hold back. Right. Now spray the coat. Okay. <laughs> Right, right. Really, really, really. That's it. That's it. Right. Now notice, Jody. What's happening to the water? Sliding it's sliding off. Do you want to do a bit more? Or do you want to finish? <laughs> 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 okay. The reason for illustrating that is that's a new coat, okay, and it, it's it's got one of those water repellent finishes on it. So the water literally runs straight off it, which is a good thing and a bad thing. If you haven't got waterproof trousers on, it defeats the object because the water just runs straight off, straight down your trousers, you end up with wet legs. Okay, so when I'm walking the dog in the rain, I still get wet, just not on the top half of me. But water just runs straight off that. And I think what Francis Chan was getting at is when we listen to God's word, it's just like that waterproof coat. Yeah, it just runs straight off us. Sometimes it might make it to the front door of the church. Occasionally, if we're really, really godly and holy, it might make it to Monday morning. And for the super, super holy, we may still remember it by the time we get to the following week. So often, we don't allow God's word to really do what it's meant to do, and that's to transform our lives, to change us completely. Let's not be people who are sermon-proof. Let's read God's word and allow it to change us. Let's read God's word and let it point out to us where we're going wrong. Let's read God's word and let it point out to us what we need to do for other people. And there's a little bit, isn't it, about you know, the religion that, that God wants. Okay? Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, James has gone on all of this about not being angry, putting off the moral filth, not being... All these things he said, and at the end, he just almost like he tags this on at the end this bit about looking after the widows and the orphans. And the reason for that is, if, if in, in Bible times, if, if you was a widow or you were an orphan, you were in big trouble. Because there was no uh, social services, there was no NHS, there was no kind of backup for you. If you were widowed or orphaned, you were financially in trouble. You had no way of supporting yourself. God is saying to us that if we don't, look after the widow and the orphan and there are lots of equivalents in our society today then he's saying our religion is worthless now for all of us that's going to look different but it all goes back to the same thing it's about reading God's word allowing it to speak to us and acting on what God wants us to do and it will be different for you than it will be for me because God will have all of us doing different things for me and, and, and for, for our family God clearly spoke to us about what he wanted us to do in serving his kingdom. And I tell you what, when you serve God, when you act on what it says in his word, when you're obedient to it, it's actually fun at times. It's hard work at times. Yesterday afternoon, I'll give you an example, okay? One of the things we're doing at the moment, we're fostering a, a, a little baby, um, Anna Lee. She's absolutely gorgeous, okay? And I had to spend the afternoon, and bear in mind, this is a mission that God's given us, just to prove to you it can be fun, she didn't want to settle yesterday afternoon. So for two hours, okay, I was just holding this baby. I was walking. That's just an exaggeration. It was about an hour and a half. I 
always tend to exaggerate things. Forgive me, okay? It was an hour and a half, okay? Trish, how long was it? It was about an hour and a half, wasn't it? Yeah, it was good. Okay? I was carrying this baby around who didn't want to settle around our garden. Every time I stopped, it burst into tears again. So I'm just walking around our garden. And do you know what? I noticed this, we had this massive caterpillar. It was ugly looking. I'm not going to exaggerate. It was a big caterpillar. Okay? But I was just doing that. And as I was doing it, I was thinking, wow, this is what God's given me to do. This is one of the missions God's given me to do. This is so cool. And I was actually thanking God for doing it. And I'll tell you, if you've seen my garden, okay, it's probably twice the size, it's tiny. It's a tiny little garden. So it's not like I had this great big garden to go around and explore and, you know, get lost in. I was just pacing, literally. But that was one of the missions God gave me, to look after children. And it's hard work, but do you know what? I love it. We love it. Okay? Never be afraid to go to God and say, okay, God, I've read your word. I want to I read more of it. What do you want to say to me today? What do you want me to do? And some of you are already doing it. Some of you are in jobs where God's using you there. You may be the only Christian people come across. But always go back to God and say, what do you want me to do? And don't be sermon-proof. If you only remember one thing from this morning, remember my waterproof coat and say, I don't want to be like Lee's waterproof coat. What? I want it to be like a, a nice piece of cotton or you know, wool, something that you know, when, when it gets soaked, it absorbs water. Let's be like that. Let's absorb God's word. And I want to leave you with a very very easy to say but hard to do challenge. I want to ask you this week to spend some time with God and be serious about it and say, God, what that I'm not already doing do you want me to do? And God, if you ask him that and you really, really mean it, I think you'll be surprised that God will bring things up. And some of them you'll be like, that's not me. And, 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 and you'll have a hundred reasons for not doing it. But I tell you this, if you go with the one reason that God told you to do it, you'll see the fruit in it. So I dare you to go away this week and ask God what he wants you to do in response to reading his word. And don't be sermon proof.